A lot of the planters in the other islands made enormous fortunes. The hope was that the profits from the estates would help to sustain, not only to sustain them, but to allow them enough money to invest in whatever else they wanted to invest. And we have, for instance, an example of proprietors from St. Vincent who were able to establish um, properties, well, renowned properties and so on in different parts of the UK. Thomas Phillips, who had bought the Camden Park estate. Although in the case of Phillips, Phillips was a wealthy man before he came to St. Vincent. He made money um, in the East, in, in India. But he got compensation, and that compensation might have been part of what he used to invest or to, to um, contribute to the, the university in, in Wales. The intricate relationship between slavery and education in St. Vincent and the Grenadines reflects the island's colonial history and the ongoing pursuit of empowerment. Enslaved individuals were systematically denied education during the colonial era to maintain control and exploitation, hindering personal growth and perpetuating subjugation. British education policy for the Caribbean colonies were aimed at producing a limited number of educated elites to serve the colonial masters. Following the nation's independence, education gained traction as a tool for social advancement, extending access to all citizens and diverging from the oppressive past. Disparities in quality education, especially in marginalized regions, underscores persistent systematic imbalances. Addressing this challenge necessitates fostering inclusivity and equity. Today, the education system in St. Vincent and the Grenadines continues to grapple with its colonial legacy. It's like of a one cloth fit all and it affects, for me it affects some of the students because we are living in an age where not all students, not all children are capable of you know, the study in the books and, you know, um, I think that they should be introduced to hands-on experiences at, at, you know, at a young age. Children at the primary level are the ones that are lost. It's no child left behind. Even if you don't pass, you get to go into secondary school and enough remedial education is not being done at the secondary level to bring them up to par. Despite many challenges, attempts to reform the education system are on the way. The growing recognition of education's pivotal role in national development presents hope for a truly equitable educational landscape through concerted effort. In terms of the university and higher education levels of the educational revolution, it's the best thing ever. Children now have access to not only children, parents who never had access when they would at that age, now have access to university through, through grants, scholarships, bursaries. The government is making so many things available for us as Vincentians to go out there and pursue higher education. And with higher education, we have a more educated system in St. Vincent that is able to give back and structure the country in a way that it should be. Encouraging Vincentians to pursue higher education abroad presents a potential solution. This equips them with the skills to contribute to their homeland's growth and break the cycle of inequality. However, the prospect of brain drain looms, with some not returning due to limited opportunities domestically. The government intervention is vital by establishing frameworks to optimize the benefits of higher education. Incentives for return coupled with programs nurturing skilled workers can align advanced education with the country's progress. Originally it was 40 of us, but only 38 of us to actually took up the opportunity to come to Wales and study at University of Wales Trinity St. David. I think we were told that the scholarship was being offered from the then Prince of Wales, who is now King Charles of England. 
he offered the scholarships to St. Vincent and the Grenadines in an effort to give back um, in light of the recent volcanic activities that took place in St. Vincent in 2021, I think, yeah. Of course, there are challenges associating with traveling overseas for education. It can be expensive and it can be difficult to adjust to a new culture. However, the rewards can be great. The university was approached by uh, His Majesty the King, King Charles, uh, who was, as Prince of Wales, our royal patron. And His Majesty was deeply, deeply concerned with what he saw with regard to the disaster on the island. And he wanted to make sure that uh, we also played our part. We had the opportunity to engage and offer support for youngsters from St. Vincent's and the Grenadines. And as a university, we were delighted with the opportunity of reaching out a hand to support youngsters and offer scholarships. And that is why I contacted the Prime Minister and facilitated the conversation of developing an international program, a program of scholarships where we could work together to identify meaningful opportunities for youngsters to come to Wales to study for three years and then of course to go back to St Vincent of the Grenadines and to learn and to use that knowledge for the benefit of their own communities. The scholarships were being offered and I said you know what apply grab the opportunity and then you can go back and make an impact. So I applied I, I know I was awarded the scholarship so we're here now at University of Wales and we are part of the Commonwealth and as a Commonwealth country whoever is in charge in England king or queen is our head of state so as much as we have a prime minister and a governor general the governor general is the head of state representing the king or queen in St Vincent so the king is basically our top boss <laughs> if you look at it that way so yeah, so he had, um, he's the Prince of Wales, like I said, he was the Prince of Wales before when we got the scholarships, but since his mother has passed, he has assumed the position of King. So in his giving back to Wales and to St. Vincent at the same time, that's how we were merged. Vincentians who study overseas can come back with new ideas and perspectives that can help to improve their country. So we started um, online, you know. Online experience is good, yeah, but it has its good and it's bad, especially when you're home and you wake up tired. The block style of teaching, I think it's different from um, Kville, different universities in the Caribbean, because um, we have like, we would do one module like for like four or three weeks and then we'd have like a little break, like a week break, prep week, it's called, and then we'd go on, after the prep week, we'd go on to our next module. So we, we, learn, a, we learn a bit about the different political systems of um, different countries. We learn a lot about their culture. And in, in doing all of this, of course, you have to study the history. Uh, so these were some of the really interesting things that I found. We learned how to do different um, stuff, such as um, proposal, grand proposals, and so forth. So if we were to become leaders, um, we have certain skills that we would be able to apply, practical skills. It's been a bit receptive. They're very cool, warm, welcoming to us. I can't say we feel shunned or anything like that. We have not, well, I have not personally encountered any bit of racism, as you're told that the UK has a bit of racism, but I have not encountered that. So it's been okay so far. I've actually met King Charles, so it's pretty cool. This year in July, he was here on campus. There was an event and the Vincentian students were invited to meet Prince Charles. Just another, just felt like another normal person because he did not come off like he didn't give us an air. He just treated us like we are normal citizens. But he did have to address them as his, his majesty, so yeah, his royal highness, I should say, yeah. The University of Wales, Trinity St. David, is the oldest royal chartered university in Wales and is the third oldest royal chartered university in England and Wales. This year, we're celebrating our bicentenary and noting where higher education began in Wales. A long-standing tradition of 200 years. 200 years of supporting youngsters to have university education, not only in Wales, but of course further afield. At the heart of our mission is transforming education, transforming lives. 
and that has been so important for the university over so many years. And it is true today as it was when Bishop Burgess established St. David's College in 1822. If you go over to what is called the Roger Bowen Library, they have an archive that's located in the lower levels of the library and they have some pretty old books. There's a map of St. Vincent over there, um, one of those full-size ones. It's, it's a really old uh, uh, map. Here within the University of Wales Trinity St. David, identity is key. It's so important for students to have the opportunity with confidence to take time to consider who they are what they believe, and to reflect on their history. One of the key themes for me in welcoming students from St. Vincent and the Grenadines was to make sure that they had the opportunity not only to acquire new skills, but also to have the critical time to reflect on who they were and on their history. This comprehensive strategy holds the potential to redress historical imbalances and propel St. Vincent and the Grenadines towards a more equitable and promising future. Ensuring equitable access to the wealth of learning resources available in the United Kingdom and Europe for the descendants of the enslaved and the indigenous peoples, including funding for infrastructural development and access to educational materials, holds immense importance in understanding and embracing origins. This is Jeffrey's um, Atlas, West India Atlas. 1775. Well, this is um, a part of the Thomas Phillips collection. It's one of the books that he donated to the college. And as it says here, the first commissioner for the disposal of lands in the ceded islands. So that's the territory that Britain acquired after the Seven Years' War. And so Young, I suppose, is responsible for seeing how British territory will be divvied up. It says here, an actual survey made in the year 1773 after the treaty with the Caribs. So they were treated as a di diplomatic and political entity, a power, for the, for the few years from then until the Carib was. And what's, what's telling in not just the very spare detail, so it says after, after the treaty with the Caribs, and then the island of St. Vincent, it gives its length and breadth. It says 22 rivers, and importantly, capable of turning sugar mills. So right at that moment, the sort of raison d'etre of European British colonialism is there. And that this is a plan to transform St. Vincent into a plantation economy. And there you have York Bay, um, which is the location of Camden Park Plantation, as it was. And we were interested in uh, the botanical gardens, weren't we? We were d discussing that earlier. How I think it's the first uh, scientific agricultural station in the Western Hemisphere. So yeah, so they, there would be plant crops, fruits introduced to see whether they could become native, and um, probably the most famous one being uh, breadfruit. Mm. So What's striking, I think, from the map is the division of the. European, as it were, the European colonial space versus the indigenous space. Mm -hmm. We've got the four parishes, tellingly the patron saints of England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales, George, Andrew, Patrick and Wales, St. David, versus this space that's just referred to as Carabland, mm -hmm. and which was Carabland by the Treaty of 1773. Uh, um, I have seen it in some of the deep books um, in the late 18th century, early 19th century of instances where some of the people who were involved in the Camden Park Plantation were buying land from what were called quote yellow caribs some of whom were named as well so um, it just goes to prove the sort of um, agency of of the carib or Kalinago people. The western um, region here is very much covered in forestry still today, which is uh, um, on the map. And in a way, that's testament to the relative lateness of um, plantation economy being introduced to the car uh, to St. Vincent. So we've got, we've got the statue, yeah. the bust down here, um, having been on display for maybe 150 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is fair to say it's fairly temporary 
solution. Yeah. Um, it's nice that he's been knocked off his pedestal, literally. Mm. Um, but I think there's a way, the, the most feasible way for us to, the university to display this, not in the way it used to be displayed, but to or explain. To explain. We're, we're in the Founders Library at the University of Wales Trinity St. David in Lampadere. This Founders Library uh, is where the original books donated by Thomas Phillips in the 1840s and 50s were stored. They were moved out of here in 2010 to the archives where they're held in temperature controlled, humidity controlled conditions because some of them are very, very old. But at one time, the bust of Thomas Phillips was in this position here. And it was moved down to the old hall downstairs. And on the 30th of November last year, it was removed from public view and taken out of uh, the old hall and is now stored, wrapped up in the archives. We've been talking about access to education. And I think the starting point for me is we live in a society, all of us humans, marked by power and inequality. And if we want to do something about genuine equality of access to education right across the planet, we have to deal with those political issues of power and inequality. And having the Vincentian students with us for just over a year now, they've brought new experiences and a new angle on just how unequally shared power is across this planet of ours. It occurs to me that one of the most impressive and important things that could be done, uh, particularly in the more developed industrialized countries of the West, would simply be to lift the debt burden off the back of the countries of the global South. In my research, I've realized why those barriers were erected in the first place. So I did my PhD on the history of museums. And even though museums, public museums in the 19th century were founded in the name of Britain's working classes, they were bastions of bourgeois privilege. They were there to differentiate Britain's classes and to be exclusive spaces. So I suppose the importance that I view on education and access is to try and um, challenge centuries of exclusivity and that applies within British society and then of course it's even more manifold when teaching uh, Vincentian students and other people from the global south and the just the sheer sense of them not being not only excluded in the sense of not thinking it's for them, there's just no way that they could physically access those um, museum or library collections or the type of amazing manuscripts that you saw down in the vaults in the Roderick Bowen Library and Archive. It's been a pleasure and in fact it's a, it's a, a source of regret that I haven't continued in the same role because um, Andy and I were involved in the build-up to the Vincentian students coming and as much as we thought, okay, this is a, a great opportunity for them, I don't think I could have contemplated until getting to know them just how transformative a moment it is for them to come over here. And it's very humbling in that regard to see how some of the things that we take a bit for granted are out of the norm, out of the everyday expectation of the Vincentian students and their peers. So it's been a really brilliant thing. It's, it's livened up the campus a lot. It's exposed us to new culture. It's maybe challenged us on a few things and to correct some of our practices. But from my point of view as well, it's been, from a selfish point of view, I suppose, is I've learned a great deal from teaching, teaching them. Um, to give an example, I've slightly changed my perspective on histories of transatlantic slavery in so far as um, one of the classes that I taught the Vincentian students on was to do with the Haitian Revolution. And when I teach that to British students, I always have to explain where Hispaniola was, where Satan the Man was, 
what the modern day nation state of Haiti is, who Toussaint Louverture was. And it's sort of predicated on the fact that, or the impression that in Western historiography, Western scholarship, um, that the Haitian Revolution has in uh, the words of a famous book on the topic been silenced, silencing the past. So I went through all my standard spiel on this with the students. And then because of a very polite bunch, probably about 50 minutes later, it became clear we already know all this. This is part of our, our, our primary and secondary education in, in recent generations in St. Vincent's and the Caribbean more generally. So I suppose what I learned there is how different history can look from different perspectives, from different generational perspectives, different geographical and different national perspectives as well. The, the descendants of enslaved people, including perhaps people who have familial connections to those who were enslaved by Thomas Phillips, the ability for them to come and enjoy the collections that that enslaver formulated is remarkable. It's a it's a it's something that no one could have imagined 200 years ago. We wouldn't have imagined it three years ago, to be honest. So I think it's a start. It's a brilliant thing. As I say, we learned a great deal from the Vincentian students. Hopefully, they've learned from us. But I suppose in the long run what we'd like is that this becomes more of the norm than the exception that people from the caribbean have more access have chances on opportunities to come and study in the uk on a regular basis rather than just an ad hoc basis rather than on the ad hoc basis of the now king happening to have a conversation with the vice chancellor of the university. Because um, at the moment, in, in a sense, the, the um, Vincentian students are being given a chance to excel in spite of the educational environments in the Caribbean. Whereas in the long run, hopefully with more moves towards restorative justice and reparations, there'll be a system in place that they can have the expectations to achieve and educationally and have access to opportunities to come and study in the UK and also to develop heritage infrastructure and educational institutions in the Caribbean as well. I chose international development and global politics as my degree because it's, like I said, I've always been involved in non-governmental organizations. So I know what it is to give back and to influence change and things like that in St. Vincent. On the international scale is where I want to see myself. I don't just want to do things that are going to benefit my home country. I'm hoping to work globally and effect change, not only in small islands, but in big developing nations. Because I have a son and I want to impact his life. I want to set policies that are going to benefit generations to come not just the generations that are here now. Make changes now for those coming behind. I don't really have a plan as yet, but I think as I continue over and over, because everything is a process, you know, as I go over and over, something will come up and I will put my target to this certain, to make, make plans for the future. I'm aspiring to be an entrepreneur, but as I said, I can't say that part as yet. Um, I would also like to dedicate most of my time like, to like, non-profit organizations, create my own as well, and like, help other non-profit organizations in different parts of the world that I see need help. Um, I would also like to give back to my home country, St. Vincent, in whatever way I can. Um, I would say, I, see my, I can see myself walking in St. Vincent, just for a short time, I guess. Um, just to assist persons in need, I may say, that I think would be in need 
um, I would like to also assist like children who children who are not capable who are not capable of like helping themselves mothers who are in need and who can't afford certain stuff I would also like to help them so in the future I see myself heading back home and helping out as much as I can you know given that there are still a few persons still recovering from the volcanic eruption you know hopefully God's willing I'll be able to you know help building low-income homes you know or even having apartment buildings you know that persons can actually go and stay at because you know given st vincent we have a lot of we do have apartment buildings but they're very small they're, they're more mainly um family owned and so forth but if we can have more central apartment buildings where persons who may not be able to afford having their own you know home and so forth can you know pay a small fee a month to stay and you know accommodate their family as well so plan is to you know go back and impact community impact my country as, as an educator not only as an educator but as a as a, as a vincentian you should look at it as, as a medium of, of change you wanting to be a part of your country and impact your country in in, in a positive way for me higher education is, is is very important if we see it as a, as a medium of of change I, I've come into uh, education as a lecturer very late in my working life. My, my working life has been more involved with political activism, labour movement campaigning, and then working in development uh, for, for many years, for 16 years or so. Um, and I've learned from all that experience and I try to share that now with the students and also to learn from their, their experience. Yes, I, I think sharing experiences at a higher education level is important, can be very, very important. But I always like to get the message across to students, wherever they come from in the world, that there should be a purpose to this. And that uh, whatever learning and research that we do as individuals uh, should be used in a way in accordance with our beliefs in what is right and wrong. So education is not an end in itself, in my opinion, but it's a door that should open itself to activism, to commitment, to making changes, to making improvements in the lives of all of our fellow citizens. There should be a purpose to it. And to me, that's quite an inspiring message. It's not just about get your qualification and get a job, but it's inspiring people to, to believe that you each of you can make a difference and you have some responsibility to do that. We're all global citizens and we all have some kind of a responsibility to try and make the world a better place. When the students from St Vincent and the Grenadines arrived here in Wales and at the University of Wales, Trinity St David, one of the key messages that I gave to them was be sure of who you are and be confident of who you are. Yes, they came to Wales to have the opportunity to learn new skills, to have the opportunity to appreciate another culture. But at the heart of the university education is having that confidence to stand back and reflect and celebrate on one's own history. And that is so important in the context of St Vincent and the Grenadines. What a rich heritage, what a rich culture. And I sincerely hope that the students from this university, as they go back to their country, as they go back to St. Vincent's and the Grenadines, will focus upon that real deep history and the wealth of that history, the Garofuna language and culture, and to be proud of it. We all should be proud of that and make sure that there are opportunities within our educational system, be that in primary, secondary, or university education that allows us to have the quality opportunity to celebrate our past, to acknowledge the past, and to build on that heritage for a common good. To working with the citizens of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and to develop, hopefully, a lasting partnership that will make a difference. The bonds of friendship that have been developed between the students and the university will last. 
These are not for two or three years. These are long lasting associations. And I firmly believe, and I passionately believe, it'll make a difference and support global education, global citizenship, and make a difference to the lives of the communities of the future. The journey to higher education is not easy, but it is one that is worth taking. By traveling overseas to study, Vincentians can help to build a better future for themselves and their country. She thought she had all the answers. We don't need no one to 